Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. My name is Mildred I'm from Toronto. My home group is the Rocks Glen Traditional Group. And I will say, if you happen, should come to Toronto, please give me a call. I'd love to take you there and show you our hospitality as you've showed it to me. My dry date is May the 18th, 1973. I have a sponsor. I have killed a few, I guess. <laughs> anyway, I have always had a sponsor, and I have always sponsored. And with that, uh, I will say to you, good evening. I'd like to thank Lee for making the phone call to me and Anne for carrying on and, uh, you know, offering your hospitality. I'd also like to thank Carolyn. Where are you, Carolyn? You're a honey, you know. She came to pick me up at the airport and had the courtesy to send me an email to explain uh, the fact of a shuttle and so on. It made it very easy, and uh, I really thank you for that, Carolyn. And, you know, I always, when I come to these things, you know, I realize there are two people here who do an awful lot of work. I think sometimes we take our tapers for granted. You know, when I see them come in and the stuff that they lug in for our convenience and the work that they do for our convenience, let's give them a nice round of applause. John, there's been a lot of talk about people wanting a Lee in their life. I'd be happy to have a John in my life. (laughs) And a Lee, too! Woo! (laughs) Could be a very good trip. (laughs) Okay. I love the energy here, and I must say, I love being with a bunch of women, and that in itself is a miracle, because I didn't start out like that. I came to Alcoholics Anonymous the first time in 1966, and um, I was excited. I left home in the early 50s, and when I left home, uh, my father said, say goodbye to your brother, because you will not be seeing him again. The doctors say he is dying. Now, you have to remember, you know, recovery has become a household word. You know, we hear it on television. We hear it all over. In the early 1950s, it wasn't around. The American Medical Association didn't declare alcoholism a disease till 1956. And so the doctor said it's his liver, it's his stomach, it's whatever, whatever. And so I said goodbye to my brother, and about two years later, my father called me, and he said, your brother isn't going to die. He said, something amazing has happened. He said, actually, it's a miracle. Your brother didn't have all those diseases. He said, there's a new outfit has come to Saskatchewan. He said, it's called Alcoholics Anonymous. And he said, they have done what, he said, I don't know what this is all about, but they've 12-stepped him. He's an alcoholic. He has stopped drinking, and he's been transformed. And damn, that was a big word for my father to use. (laughs) When he said, my brother has been transformed, I paid attention. I could tell my father was pleased. He said, you know, your brother doesn't drink anymore, and he works, (laughs) which was a very good sign for for my father. And he said, you know, he he goes with some of the others to sit in the hospital. They had a room, like Sister Ignatia used to do in Akron, and they would sit with wet drunks there. 
That was my introduction to Alcoholics Anonymous. So in 1966, when Dr. Hoffer intervened in my case and said I should go to Alcoholics Anonymous, I was excited. Did I need AA? I sure needed something. By that time, I had been I had been locked up in mental institutions, psych wards, and insane asylums 32 times. I had uh, been tied to the bed, and it wasn't with Good Time Charlie, believe me. <laughs> they would put me in straight jackets. I was no stranger to cold water baths. I'd had hundreds of hours of therapy. Um, I had been in a convent for 15 years. None of that fixed me. I even married my psychiatrist, and that didn't <laughs> fix me either. See, I always know how sick a crowd is when they laugh at that. <laughs> Very sick. <laughs> did I want AA? Sure I did, but I wanted it on my own terms. See, by that time, 1966, I was already in what we would the book calls a state of pitiful and incomprehensible demoralization. And uh, how did I get that way? See... I talked about it this morning, not in detail, but I had a retarded... They called her retarded. She was injured at birth, is what the truth was. And she couldn't learn as fast as the other kids. And at that time, the school system didn't know what to do with... They didn't have the means in place as they do now to allow people to learn at the rate that they can. My mom and dad were not educated people. They didn't know. They did what their hearts said. They looked after her. They protected her. She knew she was different. The kids in the community made fun of her. Her name was Dorothy. They called her Dumb Dora, and she cried. She knew she was different, and she she hate, she didn't... Yeah, I guess she hated. She'd cry at night. She was 16, I was 3, and she'd crawl into bed with me, and she'd say, Mildred, why was I ever born? Why didn't I die in the cradle? That was my introduction to the world, and I used to cry with her. You know, and I've often said, if you had taken a two-by-four and smashed me across the back, it wouldn't have hurt me as much as that crying. And so I, I became the fixer. Now, we were Roman Catholic. We, there were ten of us. I was the baby. I was much younger than my brothers and sisters. And so... Um, I made it my business to try to get my brothers and sisters. I knew they loved me. I was their pet. I knew they loved me, and I thought that all I had to do was tell them what they should do. They would go, they would treat Dora the way I told them to, and it would all be simple, isn't it? Well, try it. You see, in those days, we didn't talk about that stuff. You know, in all the years, we never, ever discussed Dora's situation in terms of how we felt about it, what we could do about it. People didn't in those days. Now we do it on public television. But then we didn't do that. And the conclusion I made when Dora didn't get fixed, Dora continued to cry, was, I'm not important. Nobody cares about me. And I became very afraid because I realized something. When you've got a problem, you better, you better make sure you don't get problems. Because when you got one, nobody helps you. Somehow or other, it just doesn't work that way. So the way to go is to make sure you don't get problems. That's where I got filled up with those old belief systems that I didn't understand. Now, we were Roman Catholic, went to church, and I never heard that God was mean. I heard the priest say that God was love and God was power, and by heaven, I had my solution. I'm going to tell God what's going on, and when I tell God what's going on, then he's going to fix it, and everybody's going to be happy. Well, the truth is God did fix it, but just not according 
to my desires. See? And so I became confused because I didn't turn against God. I just felt he was a useless twit. Like, <laughs> what's the point in having a God in your life if if that God with power doesn't do anything for you? I didn't fit. I didn't fit with my brothers and sisters. I didn't fit in school. I didn't fit anywhere. At five, I took a drink, and I knew there was a God. I knew that there was something that could make me feel okay, because I didn't feel okay the way I was, even as a kid. And so when my father made homebrew, and one night his his cronies were there, and they were drinking. I wasn't afraid of alcohol. Alcohol wasn't a big issue. There was my brother, who was an alcoholic, but he, you know, he didn't bring a lot of his difficulties into the home. And when people drank in my home, they became more cheerful. It was fun. My dad would sing and he would dance and it was, it was great. And so I poured some of that homebrew into me. I didn't do it because I knew anything was going to happen, but I believe I came onto the planet an alcoholic because I was an alcoholic from the word go. It's interesting the way Dr. Silkworth talks about it. He says we're restless, irritable, and discontent until we can again experience ease and comfort that comes from taking a few drinks. See, he doesn't say we're restless, irritable, and discontent until we can drink alcohol. I didn't come onto the planet crying because I was a quart short. You see, <laughs> what the alcohol did was, you know, and I explained that this morning. It, it made everything okay, almost instantaneously. And that's what I chased for the next 35 years. And I have to tell you, in those 35 years, there wasn't really much that I didn't do to get a drink. And it took me right to a park bench. I didn't grow up in a family that lived on a park bench. I grew up in a family that had dignity, that had integrity, that people that were respected in their community. That's who I grew up with. And the convent certainly didn't teach me about park benches and skid row and didn't expect that that's where I would wind up. You know, I'd like to tell you that my story is the story of somebody who drank too much. That isn't really. See, Bill, Bill is clear about it. It's just a statement in there. But in the Step 4 writings, he says, alcohol is the symptom. He doesn't say it's the problem. It created problems for me because it was such a great solution. I felt okay, and for many, many years, I functioned when I drank. You know, yeah, I drank too much, and I'd hide that. But when I, you know, when I smoothed out, I behaved better. People seemed to like me, and I seemed to like people. And as long as I didn't, because I, I didn't get violent when I was starting to drink. And so... You heard that. <laughs> anyway, I didn't fit. And I knew how I could feel okay. So I started stealing booze right off the bat. I started finding ways that I could get booze. Obviously, when you're five and six and seven, you drink different than you do when you're 37. But the fact was... And you know, the person who saw it and who talked to me about it was Dora. She'd shake her fist at me and she'd say, you're going to become just like Henry. Because, you know, she knew that he drank too much. I didn't fit at home. I didn't fit in school. My parents sent me to a convent a finishing school. I didn't fit there. When I was fit, finished with high school at 15, I wanted to go to, I wanted to be a lawyer. I thought that would be a great, you know, uh, career for me. But I didn't go. You know, for years, I couldn't tell the truth about this. I didn't go because I was full of fear. 
I was raised on a farm. And, you know, we didn't have television. I knew nothing of, of the big world. And, but what I did know was this. If I'm going to do that, I'm going to go into a place. I'm going to have to go with people I don't know. I'm going to have to go to the university. I'm going to have to do all kinds of things that filled me with fear, and I wouldn't do them. See, the book says, how does it word it? It talks about all the things we've lost because of fear, and that our lives are shot through with this fear. Mine certainly was. And so I hung around for two years, and then at 18 I decided I'm going to a convent. See, I was giving up on humans fixing my life. I didn't feel okay. And so I thought, maybe if I go and do this thing, I'm going to take those vows of poverty, chastity, and obedience, and I'm going to dedicate myself to sacrifice and all that. And then I'm going to do God's work, and then God's going to do my will. That's a good way to go, don't you think? Well, it would be nice if it worked that way. But I don't believe that. I was drunk the night I entered, and they took me anyway, which probably says as much about them as it does about me. <laughs> and I was there 15 years. Uh, people are always curious, how do you stay drunk? And I always say, are you an alcoholic? If you're a red-blooded alcoholic, you and the booze are going to meet, guaranteed. I think you could put me on Mars and I'd be drunk. I'd find a way to do it. Um, I always had all the jobs in the church, and if my supplies that I used to have delivered to the bell tower of the church, if they were getting small, then I would uh, drink mass wine. And if I drank too much, I'd go and sit in the confessional and sleep it off, and everything was great. In January of 1966, I had a very enlightened mother superior, and she called me and she said, Sister, she said, I don't think you're happy here. See, in all those years, nobody ever challenged the fact that I drank and that I had all kinds of stuff hidden under my mattress. That mother superior knew. I guess, you know, in those days, you have to remember, people weren't knowledgeable. And so what she saw was Mildred isn't happy, and she said, would you like to leave? Well, yeah, I'd like to leave. But when you are raised the way I was and indoctrinated, you know, I believed in those days in a heaven and hell beyond the earth. And I, we were told that if you take final vows, then if you leave the church or you leave your, you know, your convent, you endanger your immortal soul. Well, if you really believe in, in that stuff, you're going to think twice before you do that. <laughs> anyway, Mother Superior and I wrote to Rome, and I got my dispensation, and I remember very clearly standing on the convent steps, and it was January 1966, January the 10th, and I felt okay. I'm okay. I'm no longer Sister Mary Eugenia. I had signed my dispensation. I had my secular clothes on, and I had been dispensed from keeping the vows of poverty, chastity, and obedience. Had fiddled around with those a bit anyway, as the need arose. I, di I didn't know how to do secular life. And I remember thinking, well, I've got to put this together, and I went out, you know, I just was so awkward, so awkward. And there was a singles dance someplace, and I went to that. And, of course, the only way I could bear to be there was to get drunk. And, of course, the losers picked up on me, and I learned that the bars were there and the men were there. And I have to tell you, and I won't go into detail because it's a drastic picture. In ten months, I just went right to hell. And I had come out of that convent fairly innocent. There was nothing innocent about me by the time November of 1966 came. I had done it all, and I was ashamed of it all, and I felt dirty beyond dirty, and I didn't know what to do. And somebody 
somebody told me about a psychiatrist at the Ontario Insane Asylum, and I went there. And I have to tell you, I felt comfortable there. And I didn't want to leave, and after two weeks, my brother found me, and uh, he took me back to the prairies, which is where my home was. And, um, you know, when you think about life, you think about decisions you made, and you see that you got to be at the exact right place. He said, do you want to go to Regina or Saskatoon? I said, well, Saskatoon, because it was about 70 miles from our family farm. And there, I was to meet Dr. Hoffer. Dr. Hoffer knew about Alcoholics Anonymous. You have to understand, by that time, I had a file that thick. I'd been diagnosed with every every disease, mental and otherwise, in the books. And Dr. Hoffer knew Bill Wilson, because Bill Wilson had consulted him about the LSD. And so he knew about AA, and he went to my doctor, and he said... Uh, this woman, you know, we have to rethink. She's not all that stuff they say she is. She's an alcoholic, and she should go to Alcoholics Anonymous. And so when my doctor came to me and said, you know, we think this should happen, I was excited. All I could think of was, my brother got transformed. I'm going to get transformed. And I went to AA, and I waited. <laughs> I really didn't know what was going to happen. I didn't know who was going to do it. But three weeks three weeks later, I just felt as crappy as I ever had. And so I know now there is stuff you can do and take that will change the way you feel. And I'm not going to get into that except to say I learned something those five and a half years. You can run to all the meetings and you can park your hiney on the chair and if you don't go to meetings, work the steps, what else? What else? Right. If you don't do that stuff, you're lost. I sat there for five and a half years. I don't know if any of you remember Cease Corgill. He was my first sponsor because I was in Prince Albert. That's where I got my first teaching job. And, and you know how different life was. I, I phoned a school. They had advertised for a teacher, and the principal said to me, where are you? And I said, I'm in the psych ward. <laughs> I mean, I was, I didn't have too many skills, I can tell you. And he said, what are you doing there? And I said, well, you know, I left the convent, da, 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 da. And he said, come and see me, and he gave me a job. <laughs> Can't imagine that happening in 2011, can you? So... Anyway, for five and a half years, Cease was my sponsor, and that's when Chuck Chamberlain used to come to Prince Albert, and Wesley Parrish, and great people like that, and they talked to me. And, you know, I realize how you are what you hear tonight, what you hear at any time. It's not between you and me. It's between God and your soul and your point of readiness. Chuck used to sit with me, and he would talk to me, and he'd say, you already are everything that you can be. I didn't get it. I didn't get it. I continued on my merry way for five and a half years, and at the end of that time, I didn't, I didn't hear. I couldn't hear. My head was so full of theology and so full of this idea that I know about spirituality that I couldn't hear what was being said, and I left and I drank again. I'm not going to give you a big to-do because I don't think that's what makes me an alcoholic. I can tell you that I drank anything and everything. I'm not one of those who needed a special glass to drink a special drink. I wouldn't have known if you, the bottle was fine for me, thanks. Uh, and if I couldn't get booze, I drank perfume, Chanel Number no. 5, my personal favorite. I drank vanilla. I drank whatever I could get my hands on, and I took whatever. If you handed it to me, I didn't ask, what is this? What's this going to do? I just took it and took the consequences of whatever it was. So I left thinking, I'm okay. These alcoholics haven't helped me anyway, and uh, I'm not going to drink. And within a day, two days, I was drunk, drunker than I had ever been. 
I was jumping out of a two-story window because somebody had locked me up on the second floor. And um, I'm not too smart either because I remembered throwing out a chair <laughs> and thinking, that'll break my fall because <laughs> it was a long way down. And I landed on the chair, of course, and broke my foot, and on it goes. So I was having DT's convulsions, and I couldn't stop. See, for 35 years, I couldn't stop. My life was controlled by who had the booze, how much they had, what would I have to pay for it, where, where were we going to drink it, and all that kind of stuff. And I was willing to take the consequences because I absolutely hated the way I felt. My mother used to dog me, and she used to say, Mildred, you're such a nice girl when you don't drink. Well, the point was, she wasn't having to call somebody, because my father was dead by this time. She wasn't having to call somebody to pick me out of a ditch, and this was good. And so she'd say, you're such a nice person, and she couldn't understand that I couldn't stand the way I felt inside, see? That's what going to meetings is. That's what working the steps is all about. That's what the spiritual work is so that I can learn that things change inside and it's all about getting right with God. I can't get right with you if I don't get right with God. And I can't get right with you if I don't get right with myself and understand who I am and I knew none of that. See, so... A head full of theology doesn't do it. Nothing wrong with those who want to study theology. But I thought that because I was a well-educated woman that, you know, I knew stuff and that I was okay. And when you mentioned G-O-D, I shut down because what can you tell me about G-O-D? And there are consequences for that. So I drank for another year and a half. My husband, too, was an alcoholic, and he, too, drank. And by that time, we lost everything. And I mean everything. There was no little money stashed away. We lost the house. We lost the cars. We lost the fancy lifestyle. And people shunned us. So that by the time I got here, I didn't have a friend in the world. I never want to forget that period of my life because it was a life without without God. And um, as I said this morning, I don't need a hell after I die. I have had hell here on earth. And the, the, the hell of feeling alone, feeling I don't fit, feeling I love nobody, and nobody really loves me, as far as I'm concerned. That's hell, that kind of loneliness, being locked up in that. And um, the morning of May the 18th, I had been on a park bench for three weeks. And the morning of May the 18th, Obviously, two men found me in the in the park and took me to the psych ward. And I woke up, and there they sat, and they really were there. And uh, <laughs> I couldn't move. And by this time, I was having, you know, all these uh, convulsions. I was having blackouts, blankouts. I'd hear all kinds of things happening. I didn't, I couldn't even really move until Sunday morning and the nurse took me to breakfast and she took me to the washroom and I saw myself and I was horrified because this eye was blackened and sticking out and I had this great big purple mark. I'll never forget that. I had teeth knocked out, my hair was straggly and I weighed 85 pounds and I looked a mess and I said to her, I've become a woman of the streets, haven't I? And she said, yes, you have. What are you going to do about it? She took me to breakfast and then back to my room. And I remember standing there 
trying to figure out my options. Like, what am I going to do? I have no money. My family won't let me come home unless I don't drink, and I can't accept that. So I can't go there. My friends have said, I don't have any anymore. They've said, you come near us, and we'll call the police and have you arrested. There was nothing. I was totally broken. You know, all the education in the world doesn't matter. If your head is so scrambled that you can't even read two sentences, I remember thinking, if somebody were to come into this room and say, we've got a job for you, I couldn't take it. And so I made up my mind, that's it. I'm going to take my life, and I knew how to do it. I'd been around psych wards long enough. I'd heard enough. I knew exactly where I was going to go. I knew exactly what I was going to do. And I called, and I remember just feeling totally indifferent inside. Half an hour, it's going to be over, because I can't fix it. It's this funny thing about prayer. It's a funny thing about this business of when we're asking God to do our will. God, let me be sober. God, fix my life. God, fix Dora's life. God, do this, and nothing happens. See, I realize today I live in God's world. God doesn't live on my terms. And that morning, my prayer, I didn't call it a prayer. I don't know how to do life. I'm done. I've tried everything I can. I don't know there's a person on the planet that I could manipulate that could give me anything, would want to. I'm out of here. And then it's done, and whatever's on the other side, so be it. And I called the nurse to get my clothes, and she went to get my clothes. And as she was gone, in a heartbeat, it was as if a giant hand reached into me. I was 40 years old, and, uh, I, you know, the last, I, I hadn't drawn a sober breath if I could draw a drunken one. And in a heartbeat, that compulsion and obsession was taken away. And I stood there, and as I stand here, I still remember that morning because I didn't know what had happened, but I remember thinking, I don't have to drink anymore. That's done. And, you know, I didn't call that God. I didn't know what had happened. All I knew was in amazement, I don't, I don't have to drink. And I remember saying, whatever you are, whoever you are, I don't know how to live sober. You'll have to send me somebody. And if you do, if these words are emblazoned in my mind. If you send me somebody, I'll obey. And as I said it, there was a rap on the door. Honest to God, I still get goosebumps. You know, sometimes... I need to go back to that and remember my powerlessness. And when I was willing to open the door, somebody tells me somewhere in the book it says if you open it a crack, God can fling it open. And that to me was what happened. I opened the door and a man stood there and he said, I saw you at breakfast. Can I help you? And uh, he said, are you alcoholic? And I said, yes. Do you want to make something of it? And he said, no. He said, I came to offer you help. And two days later, he came. You know, we're a lot of good people in here, aren't we? We're a lot of good people in A who want to help others. But, you know, I have found a lot of good people who have played a significant role in my life. And he was one of them. He wasn't an alcoholic. He just knew that there was a hospital treatment center. 1973, that was unheard of. Dr. Bell had started this place, and he took me there two days later. And I had an interview, and the nurse said, yeah, you need treatment. But she said, you have no money, so we can't keep you. And as I was leaving in further despair, I hear this booming voice say, you keep her here and give her a bed. And I got a bed and it was the perfect place for me. It was a place where they didn't push God, and they didn't push AA. They did the therapy routine, and they fed you, and you had a little relaxation, 
And of course, the inevitable jitter house romance came up. <laughs> and uh, when I left, I had some hope. They gave me enough money that I could get a room on Skid Row. And the psychiatrist there who had looked after me, that was my one thread of hope. He said, I want you to come and see me once a week because I was not going to AA. And I went down to Skid Row, and that's where I lived. And he had said to me, get a job. And I went from door to door and knocked on doors for two days saying, is there anything I can do for you? And finally a man said, I have a factory. And he said, if you'll come and sweep the factory, I'll give you, and I forget what it was, it wasn't enough to have a luxurious life, that I can tell you. There were days there was no food in the fridge. It's a funny period. I'm using the wrong adjective. It wasn't a funny period. It was a powerful period because I, I put one foot ahead of the other and I kept on breathing. And once a week I went to see Dr. Maharaj and he would tell me, it's okay, Mildred, you'll be okay. I don't know how but he said, you'll be okay. And he was my hope. And he, in a sense, was my my contact to the universe. And at the end of six, about six months, I was in the institution one day, and a man said to me, do you want to come to a meeting with me? Well, men weren't exactly lined up to date me. So I went, I didn't know what meeting we were going to, and it was a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. And it's amazing how things happen. I remember not a word that was said there, but what I remember was people. And I remember they seemed to be standing in groups, and they seemed to be liking each other, and they smiled at each other. And I remember thinking, I wonder if I could ever have a friend. I wonder if I could, if I came here, if I could ever be part of a group like that. I didn't have any hope that that would happen, but... I started to come, and I fell in love with Alcoholics Anonymous. And I got a sponsor. She had blonde hair, a white suit, and gold earrings. Beautiful qualifications for a sponsor. <laughs> she was perfect. God never makes a mistake. She was perfect. I couldn't understand very much, but she used to say, you can stay sober despite what anybody does or says referring to my husband. And then she would proceed to tell me what a bastard her husband was. <laughs> I didn't care. She told me the truth. You can stay sober despite what happens. And so that's precisely what I did. I went to meetings, and she got drunk. And there were two men at the group who cared enough about their own sobriety and me to come to me and say, you're too sick to stay here if you don't do the steps. And so um, they took me through the steps. People started holding me accountable. It's a wonderful thing if you've got somebody in your life that doesn't say, oh, well, you know, you, you it's all okay. No, they held me accountable. They said, you come two hours early, we'll read the book to you, and we'll tell you how to do, what to do, to do, fulfill the conditions for the steps. And that's how I did my steps the first time. And the magic of it was, the night before I did my fifth, they told me to sit down and read my fourth step to God and to myself, as the book says. And I did it, and the light bulb went on. I was 41 years old by this time, and I had never had a thought about how my stuff had brought on the life experience that I had. All these psychiatrists and counselors, and I'm not blaming them, but we discussed how the world had impacted me. It wasn't me. It was the Pope. It was Mother <laughs> Superior. It was all, it was Dora. It was my mother and dad. It was the farm. It we always, we figured out how it had impacted me. Well, you know, I've never gotten better because you've changed. And when that night when I read that fourth step to myself and to God, the light bulb went on. You're in the middle of this mess. 
and you rolled off my back. I didn't understand it, but I knew that you were not my problem, that I was the one that had, I knew it as clearly as I stand here, that I was the one that had to change, and if I changed, I'd be okay. I don't, you see, God's grace, I believe, is is available to us all the time. I don't believe that grace is an unmerited gift. The problem with that idea is, if there are unmerited gifts, then there are merited gifts. And I have to say, what have I merited? What have you merited? See, I think everything is a gift. And I think that's what grace is. It's the activity of God that's available to us at any time when we allow that to happen. At the end of that time, um, I got a teaching job because that's my career. I'm a high school and college teacher, and uh, the God shots were amazing. My first sponsor had gotten drunk, and I had met a man in the program. Don't get any ideas. He was he was strong. I can't. He radiated strength, and he was about 15 or 16 years sober. And I just knew that he wouldn't put up with any nonsense, and I knew the game was over. I somehow, you know, maybe I couldn't have articulated it, but I knew that the way I had been living just didn't work, and I didn't know how to do life sober. Because now I'm sober, now I've got a teaching job. I am Mrs. A.A. in that school. Yeah, right. And I'm probably the most emotionally disturbed person in the, on the, the whole staff. I didn't know how to change it. See, I talked this morning about those old ideas. When students didn't do what I wanted, I didn't see what was wrong with them. It was like the rock being thrown in my pond. And what I would hear is, you're not important. They don't care about you, etc. And I would go mad. See, and I would yell and scream and carry on. And I didn't know how to, uh, how to move on in my life. The people that have done me the greatest favor are the ones who told me the truth. And he was the one, he was always kind, but he was firm. I always say he had a size 16 boot, and he didn't hesitate to apply it to my backside. And I'm very grateful to him because he really helped my life to come together. And he kept me on track. I owed piles of money. I had cheated and lied and all kinds of stuff. And uh, so he said, I want a list of what you owe, and I want a list of what you're paying back. And so that's what we did. I didn't have fancy clothes. I didn't have a fancy car. I didn't have much furniture at all. And when I'd say, can I buy this, he'd say, pull out the list. Have you paid that back? No. Well, then I guess there's no point. That gets done first. And he kept me on, on he showed me something. He also insisted that I go back to university because I was in a new field, and I went to him once, and I said, I feel so incompetent. And he said, that's probably because you are. <laughs> what would it take for you to get some competence in the field you're working in? I said, I'd have to go to university again. He said, well, what's wrong with that? And I said, well, I have to go to meetings. Wrong thing to say to that man. He said, you have a home group. You be loyal to that group, you contribute to that group, and you be there. But he said, you don't need to sit at meetings every night of the week. Are you giving the school board full value for the money they're paying you? And I had to say no. And then he said, well, it's case closed. So I went back. I did what he said. I went back to university. Those were the things. I had to challenge my fear. I had to do some of those things. And he was wise enough to see, left to my own devices, I would have just, you know, cont I got to go to meetings and I got to do this. And, you know, like one time he said to me, 
you're an English teacher, aren't you? I said, yes, because I had been going to a lot of meetings, and he said, I don't have a problem with meetings, but he said, when do you prepare your lessons? He said, you're teaching, you're teaching senior students. Don't you have to prepare your lessons so that you can help them to grow? And don't they write essays? Yes, they do. Don't you mark those essays? And I had to realize I was giving those essays a very cursory uh, response instead of sitting at home at night and, and doing. So he taught me some valuable lessons. Seven years I'm sober. The debts are paid off. And I'm thinking, now i got to invest. Because in my head, I had the idea, if I could make money, I'd be like the men. Men have money. Men have power. See, look at, look at him back there. <laughs> Flexing his muscles. Um, and I thought, if I could just make money, I'd be okay. Have any of you ever thought that? Sure we have. And... Um, he took me to his accountant, and his accountant said, you don't have any money. You don't have anything to invest. <laughs> Within 10 days, I had bought my first house. I won't go into the details of that, and I didn't cheat to do it either. But I found the right people. The right people, a teacher said to me, come on over. My, my boyfriend and I are buying houses. And I said, well, no use. She said, you come over. And she showed me a process. And I was to buy many houses in the next 10 or 12 years. And I became really quite wealthy through that process. I say that because it was one more of the lies that I grew up with, that if you have money, you're okay. Yeah, I know. I like having money. I like being able to do things and go where I want to go, etc., but it doesn't solve what's in here. And so those first 20 years, as I said, I was a good member of AA. I was a decent human being, the best I knew how to be. I was buying and selling houses. I was teaching. I was starting to speak at conferences and so on. And I had a rich, full life, and I had lots of men in my life, and life was good. Except it wasn't okay. I sat at meetings, and I saw everybody else. They looked okay. People would get up here and say, you know, I got sober, and it just gets better and better, and I'd think, good for you. What's wrong with me? It's not getting better and better. See, then when I was sober 20 years, see, I think everything just happens just right. You know, like I said this morning, Tom Ivester said to, I heard him say years ago, the ideas that I had about the way my life should go, they all went up in smoke. But I recognize that there's a power that has guided me through my experiences, and that's what I have to say. I needed those 20 years. I needed the years to sit here and say, why are you seeming to be okay and I don't feel okay inside. And then one day, I was at a conference, and a man spoke about the bondage of self. And he said, you know, he said, I'm 28 years sober now. And he said he had started this business, and the business just didn't seem to take off. And he said he got somebody to help him, and he realized that in childhood, he had taken on these old messages of, I don't deserve, I'm not okay, etc. And that was the energy. You can't, I can't get away from that because I believe that one of the things I'm here, well, the thing I'm here to do, is to take my relationship with God seriously. You know, it's one thing to be sober, but how am I growing in God consciousness? And if those old messages that I talked about this morning if they are running my life, if that's the energy that I put out, that's what I'm going to get back. And you see, he said, as he began to realize, he said, I'm a God being. That to say I don't deserve doesn't fit. If I truly believe that I'm a God being, 
Why shouldn't my business go well? And he went on and he talked about that in the third step prayer where it says, relieve me of the bondage of self. And he realized that the bondage of self for him was those old ideas. And I went running up to him after the meeting. And it was through that that, and then my friend Ted reading that portion to me from step eight. And I found the teacher who helped me to see what the old messages in me were. Because it wasn't that people didn't like, I don't think it was they didn't like me. They just couldn't trust me. Because, you see, if you triggered an old message in me, like, uh, I'm not okay, nobody loves me, I'm not important, etc., You'd meet me and you'd get a different, you'd get a different Mildred. You never knew who was going to show up. And you see, so at, I got that, that piece of information that I talked about this morning and that saved my life. People would say to me, what have you done? You are so different. See, I had a method for dealing with those old, old messages and I started to smooth out See, I think that's ultimately what Alcoholics Anonymous is about. It does for us slowly what the booze did so quickly. It helps us to feel smooth and feel okay and know. You know, I think sometimes we say to people, to new people, and I say it to you tonight, we say uh, er everything's okay or everything's going to be all right. I think that's the wrong thing. I think... You are all right. You are okay. Life is going to go on. People are going to die. People get sick. Businesses are lost. You lose your job, etc., etc. Life goes on, and through it all, we can grow in God consciousness. That's what I think the deal is about. And so I changed uh, 21 years uh I'm a little ahead of myself because at 21 years, I planned, I thought about suicide again. And I'm thinking, I'm doing everything I know how to do. I want to be happy, joyous, and free, but I don't feel that way. And I don't know how to stop the bleeding because I knew that some days I was nice and smooth and seemed to get along okay in other days you you got a different you got a different mildred and um i had another spiritual awakening and i i knew it was going to be all right i didn't know how and uh about 3 weeks later father o'brien called and i want to talk about that because he asked me to come and give a retreat I had never in my lifetime considered giving retreats, and I'm good at it. It's, I think, really what I came to the planet to do, And um, but I'd never given one. So I put a retreat together, and it was for 70 women. And I, at that point, I'm not still too crazy about women. And I finished the retreat on Sunday morning, and I find myself standing there bawling, bawling in front of a bunch of women. I know how to use a strategic tear with a man to get my way, but to bawl in front of women, uh, 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 but I did. And I heard these words come out of my mouth. I don't have a friend in the world. I just feel lonely all the time. I have many acquaintances, but I am close to nobody. And that was the truest thing I had ever said. And God bless those women. They came up afterwards, and they they nurtured me. Because the walls came down, the pretenses were gone, the defenses were gone, and I didn't know how to live. And that's when I believe I started to grow. That's when I really started to experience life. That's when I started to experience relationship, and I didn't know how to do relationship because I shut you out when I was five, when I started drinking, and I didn't know how to let, how 
all this could take place. You know, I th I think about this today. I don't even know how to describe it. I think about the days when I could sit in a room like this and feel isolated from everybody, compare myself, criticize you, find all kinds of things wrong instead of seeing. I'm on the planet just like you are. I'm one of the 6.8 billion. We're all doing the deal. We're trying to find our way to God, whether we're in the program or not in the program. We're all God's kids, and we're all trying. As one of my monk friends says, we're God seekers, and we're unhappy when we seek anything else, and I believe that. So what has happened in the last years is my heart has opened, and it's just an amazing thing. You know, I heard Marianne Williamson once say, if you're unhappy with something, say this prayer. And I've done this before. I love you, I forgive you, and I release you to the Holy Spirit. And I, from time to time, have used that. And I have felt my heart open to the whole world and to be able. And I know when I don't feel comfortable with you today, I know it's because I'm paying too much attention to self. Step three says it. Self is the root of the problem. He says we have to be rid of this self or it kills us. God makes that possible. You see, self-centeredness and God-centeredness can't, can't exist together. I live in God's world. God doesn't live here to do my bidding. But I didn't know all that. So... I, I can't describe it to you. I can only tell you that's the way I feel today. And it's a wonderful feeling to just sit there and know I'm part of you. And I don't have to judge you and I don't have to criticize you and I don't have to feel you are the competition. And because you're smart, like I said, you know, Joy gave such a beautiful talk last night and we all giggled our heads up. There would have been a time where I would have sat there and said, it's too bad that she's so good. Because if they like her a lot, they might not like me as much. Anybody identify with that? I don't feel that way. Go, girl. Go get them. <laughs> See? What's that all about? That's about God's grace that has been as powerful in my recovery as it has been in getting me to recovery. See, I think it's not by chance that the first 50 pages in our book are dedicated to step one. And I think it's a hell of a lot more than just saying I'm powerless over alcohol. I realize today I'm powerless over ev everything. I am a contingent being. I'm a guest here on the planet. I don't have any power. I don't need any power because God is unfolding my life. And as I can see, I've made the mistakes God has not. See, and that grace is available to us. Dora died, 1999. My brother-in-law called me and he said Dora uh, is in the hospital. And again, Alcoholics Anonymous was there. About six six weeks before, one of my sponsees had called and she said, you know, no, she wasn't a sponsee. I had done the steps with her. And she called and said, uh, you know, my mother just died and I want to thank you for your help. And I thought, what is she talking about? We never talked about death. And so and she said, you know, my mother was dying and I stroked her and I held her and I sang to her and I talked with her, etc. And little did I know that was the information that was going to allow me to go to Dora's deathbed and stand there as her partner for 18 hours. And I sang to her songs I hadn't sung in 50 years. I did a life review with her. She was unconscious, but... As my spiritual director said, we don't, consciousness is a lot more than what the physical ears hear. And so I closed her eyes in death. And that was a great experience. As the years have gone by, 
my brothers and sisters have died. And it's been a really big experience for me to focus on this. You know, several of you have talked about your mothers and how you got to make peace with your mothers while they were still here. I made peace with my mother, but we had such a thorny relationship it's one of the things that makes me wonder if we don't have past lives and that we meet people again, you know, that we haven't finished with. Because I can't explain it. My mother was loved in the community. She was loved by my brothers and sisters. And she and I had a thorny relationship. And I have had to do a lot of spiritual work. And I keep on doing that work. It wasn't about not, it wasn't about having to forgive her. It was just about coming to a place where I could feel comfortable thinking about my mother and coming to the point where I was, I began to wonder what kind of person would I be today if my mother and I had been comfortable with each other? I don't know. I just think everything is in divine order and it unfolds as it should. I think one of the things my life has done for me, it has driven me to God. Because what I have found over the years, as those first 50 pages say, no human power can fix me. I'm not one of those who can recover on a non-spiritual basis. I'm not one of those who can stay here on a non-spiritual basis. And I'm not one of those who can grow here on a non-spiritual basis. Meditation is important to me. Spiritual reading is important to me. Practicing the presence of God is important to me. That's what enables me to live rather than from self to live from the what I who I believe is within me. Close with saying I trust today not the God of my understanding but the God of my experience. If I could bring the God of my intellect, if that could be my God, my intellect's pretty puny. Heaven help us if that were God. But I'll tell you something. I have had an experience of God, and I'm not talking about a pink cloud experience. I'm talking about standing in that hospital room ready to go out and take my life. And in a heartbeat, the compulsion and the obsession being lifted. And in 38 years, I've never once, I haven't spent five seconds thinking, maybe I should drink, or maybe taking a drink would be a good idea. That's not Mildred. That has to be where the soul connects with grace. Bill says it. He says he was catapulted into the fourth dimension. And of us, he says, we've been rocketed into the fourth dimension. What does that mean? I think it means that God has touched us when we have, not because we prayed or said, God help me, but when we've known, I can't fix it. It's a wonderful thing. And so... He says we've been rocketed into the fourth dimension. And then he goes on to say, See to it that your relationship with God is right, and great things will come to pass for you and countless others. I've loved being here with you. Love to all of you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.